Thanks. <laughs> All right. Okay, so we're talking today about re running Drupal 7 code in Drupal 10. Matt is a developer of Retrofit for Drupal. I'm uh, the only person I know who's done a website with it. <laughs> so we're going to get into it a little, how that works a little today. Um, Matt made a nice little website. Yeah. So retrofit-drupal.com has explained the project a bit, so it doesn't just seem like a hobby project. This is meant to be a, it is a backwards compatibility layer, so that way all that code you wrote for your Drupal 7 site that runs the business, that is mission critical, you cut, paste, drop it in a Drupal 10 site, and hit the ground running, and maybe just worry about PHP 8.1 compatibilities, which I don't think is a problem because I've run code from 2004 with PHP 8.3, and it's good to go. All right, so the reason uh, for this is we've still got Drupal 7 as the version of Drupal with the most installs of any version, even uh, as of uh, last week. So this is, this is a weekly project usage. Got a lot of sites and we need to make it easier. What? Do people still run Drupal 5? Uh, there's about 170 sites that still report in that they're, they're running Drupal 5. Wow, that's like, that's old school. <laughs> yeah. All right, so I meant just to explain the goals, but I would say we, we do, I'd like to see uh, site migration from Drupal 7 to Drupal 10 be accelerated. I'd like to see an easier way to upgrade modules and themes to Drupal 10. And uh, there are cases, like in my company, where we had to do our Drupal 10 development in secret for a while because we had so many of the of our of our um, other developers who were busy trying to replace Drupal with some JavaScript framework, and uh, we didn't believe that they were going to manage to get that done by the deadline. So we had to have an alternative ready. But if we if they knew about it, they would have tried to shut us down. <laughs> so, sharing code between Drupal 7 and Drupal 10, we, we're able to, to um, up, write our, rewrite our models so that they run in both at the same time, and uh, when it was time to bring Drupal 10 out into the light, we had a head start on our, our Drupal set, uh, um, on our compatibility. So, I will move switch now to demonstrating how how we do that so we have uh, one of the big um, modules that we used in uh, in at SD Lauder is called template field some ancient Drupal 7 module that got abandoned no, nobody else uses it we still use it a lot template field precursor I haven't seen this demo yet, and I'm giddy because <laughs> so. So, oh, okay. Let me. Uh, here we go. So, good grief! What do I need? What do I need to do here? Um, here, there we go. All right. So, I'm going to get a template field. Uh, Installed here. Now, uh, just to to um, well, I'm I'm not going to explain my my uh, development platform. You, we can get to that <coughs> later. Um, oh, Drupal <laughs> template <laughs> field <laughs> dev. Is happening. Do you have a Wi-Fi connection? Oh, there it goes. Here. There. Yeah. Debugger on the purpose. Uh. Does it matter? No, I can turn that off. Uh oh. Let's see. I need to. Move it to bed. Oh. Oh. Is it because it's a D7 being recorded? 
No, I, okay, so if, let me look at my code here, a template field, I have, uh, maybe, I've got, okay, so here's, here's what we do, we put in our, our um, core version requirement, uh, info.yaml file, that's the, 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 the um, most important thing here, let's see, what is, what are these messages saying? It's saying that it just couldn't find the version. Couldn't find it. That probably means I have a typo in my composer.json file where I was. Um, <coughs> let's see here. My repos. So that is one thing. It can't parse info files to see how Drupal does extension discovery. Like I tried to have it say, "Oh, I found an info file. Convert it to be a like parse it like it used to." That part of Drupal is just too locked down. So you do have to write an info.yaml for your Drupal 7 modules. Well, it's not too horrible. Same with your theme. Like theme, you'd have to do info.yaml and make like a libraries file. So there is like some YAML writing. Um, and the whole idea of this is that you can work to get on Drupal 10 and then set up development sprints for maintenance to work off of retrofit. So it's not like you're stuck with it. It's just it's offloading and offsetting when you have to do the bulk of that work. And that's kind of like the magic behind it is to reduce that first work to get on the Drupal 10, and then you can slowly refactor things. There? Yeah. Could it be in the Composer JSON stable or div? <coughs> There's an option there, the minimum required. In the Composer JSON, so you can scroll down. In. Yeah, we can. We yeah. can. Oh, um, yeah, I can just do a, actually do a sim, sim link. Yeah, let's just possession. Yeah. That's what Composer will just do. Okay, so we'll go back to, um, there we go, modules. And if we are, if things are working, we should see it now. Template, there we go. Template field. So we're going to enable, um, what is it saying it's missing? It's saying, oh, libraries. Okay, I need to require libraries. Just make sure that should work. Of course, yeah. Yeah, I guess this is a good time, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I was curious, I saw you did a sim link to, to C tools. Is that the Drupal 7 C tools? Yes. Okay. Yeah. How do you run them both? I, I don't run, I'm not running the Drupal 10 C tools because template field, it doesn't have the, uh, template okay. field depends on the Drupal 7 C tools. And ideally, so retrofit is set up, I created like a GitHub org, because retrofit is for core. But I could see there being other packages to support, like C-Tools back with compatibility layer. Um, but right now, Retrofit's main goal is any core library, and then there could be other packages for the more they can trim as well. So instead of having to run D7 C-Tools, what if you could D10 C-Tools right. that has all, all that glue? All right. There we go. Now we can enable them. What is this? At rebuilding cash. Yeah, good idea. Might as well. Hopefully. Oh, is there gonna be I have a I have our actual code that we we use that I could uh, demo demo because uh, we know that works. <coughs> okay. So oh oh there we go, there we go. And flipped. Are they enabled? No. Okay. So yeah, let's see. Try it one more time. Or could not try it with Drush? Let's see what happens. I think it went in though. Mm -hmm. Oh, it did? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I used your new rebuild cache. 
Okay, let's give that a try. Yeah, I think the second time around the show is. All right. Well, let's find out. We go. To, let's go to our uh, <coughs> our content types and uh, try to add a, one of this field. I think it might be dimes that's showing that assert. Here, scroll down a little bit. Uh -huh. And the um, the policy oh, yeah. resolver, or and I think it's not rendering the local task because it's not sh streaming them. Um, in okay, doing turn assertions off, I guess. Yeah. All right. Okay, uh, where, where do we do that? Oh, that's right, that was taken out. Um, any set, if I can rem just remember. Um, Zend. That I don't know. Uh, Here, I know where we can fix okay. it. Okay. On the page, it gives us the line we set to remove it. It's, it's coming from retrofit. Oh, is it? Okay. Yeah. Okay, um, line 82 of. Uh, there it is. Um, oh, no, never mind. Got a lot of demos. Actually, it's not. It's probably from Retrofit doing the libraries thing for template. Okay, it's probably um, my because I used the latest version of, uh, I used 10.2 when I haven't tried it with 10.2 before. All right. Um, let's, let me, uh, let's see here. I do need to figure out how to, Turn off assertions. Where? Look at the example settings that local. Yeah. That should have. So I guess that is one thing. Like there, whenever there's a new ver minor version of Drupal core, there we go. There are going to be like tests that have to be done and make sure that they didn't change anything internally because this is basically breaking every API contract that Drupal guarantees um, to provide that backward compatibility layer. In some ways. In some ways. Okay. So we're going to do. Let's set a search <coughs> to net minus one. <coughs> oh, no. Zero. There we go. Oh, just a minute. Where, what was that? Um, I think it has to go into HTML. Any set, right? Or, yeah. All right, reload. It's gone. There we go. Create new field. There we go. So, if you've never had that, that's because it is streaming. Like we have big. It does big pipe in action for anybody that's curious. Like because it streamed the first part of the page, it went to go attach the assets, but it failed, so it didn't stream the local task. So if you ever see that, that's why it's like half broken. All right, there's template field. Continue. Oh, oh label. label. There we go. Okay, and save settings. We'll do a, and now we can edit the field. Um, set a default value. There we go. We can. Oh, we don't have any templates defined yet. Anyway, the point is we got some uh, Drupal seven field code to to run in Drupal ten. Uh, and definitely, we've got this. Uh, we've got this working on our um, on a, a site for for SC Lauder, which I can show really quick. Uh, so that how it works is whenever there's a custom field type, and this is how a lot of things are. A lot of the Drupal Seven APIs are moved from like five to six hooks to plugin classes. So essentially it is creating plugins and has its own classes that then call back to that. So when configuring a form and it says, hey, what's your form? It calls hook field form whatever to the module that defined it. So it can be rendered in and saved. Yeah. 
Oh, while we're doing, look, waiting for that site to spin up, I'll let me show what the what we had to do to get this uh, uh, running. So for uh, C tools, uh, oh, okay. oh, what happened? There we go. For C tools, I cre created a, a issue to add compatibility to with retrofit and. Uh, because CTools has a lot of, uh, of uh, class files, it wasn't as simple as just creating an um, info.yaml file. Uh, we, we also had to namespace all, all of uh, the classes. So here you see we're... we're um, yeah, this took most of the time. So yeah, we're, we're uh, putting in all our... So we have our, our uh, classes namespaced. We're, we have our use statements in here. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's the big um, thing. And then we we had to put in a, a dependency on uh, let's see here some on a module that provides uh, the the Drupal 10 method of uh, of d class discovery. So, 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 for this to be able to run in, in Drupal 7, we, we had to uh, put in this uh, uh, dependency on the PSR4XA module. So th this en en enables the, the classes to be, files to be discovered uh, and loaded, uh, um, auto-loaded, without having to be in the Drupal database because Drupal 10 doesn't have that database uh, registry for classes. And so th this, so th these um, uh, two lines here take the place of, of these lines with, with that list all the files. So namespacing your, your class files and putting in this dependency will get it to run in both Drupal 7 and Drupal 10. If it should be much simpler if you have a module that doesn't have any um, oh okay never mind that if you have a module that doesn't have any um, um, class files so we've got this module here called uh, um, the user manifest module and I want to find out if it will just work. Let's see, did I put it in here yet? No. Oh, yeah, I did. So I'm going to do a symlink to that. Okay. Now I'm going to put in uh, the info.yaml file, which we're just going to copy from from uh, um, the .info file. I'm going to use the um, the Drupal 7 uh, YAML uh, syntax here and uh, core becomes a core um, version requirement version requirement 10 dot uh, uh, oh wait 10 dot um, this one okay or okay just 10. <laughs> And uh, that should be enough to make this show up in our um, modules list. <coughs> it didn't. Let's see here. What did I miss? Maybe. What did we put in C tools? Oh, yeah, probably cash.
No type. You have to type module. It. Yep. There we go. That's, that's I missed. It. That's one reason I really wish I could have this auto work because I always forget to add the type when copying it over. All right. Um, one more cache clear, just in case. Okay. <coughs> no. Mm -hmm. huh. What do we miss? Okay. Uh, Is YAML, YAML has to be with an A? Or with oh, a? yeah. Oh, did I do that? Fun fact. Um, <laughs> I, we had somebody that does like a bunch of Kubernetes was trying to do Drupal stuff. And they couldn't get anything to load. Okay. Because they did YAML, and then Drupal like, literally does not support it. <laughs> okay, one more time. There we go. <laughs> All right, module manifest has been enabled. Let's see. I haven't actually used this module, so. I'm going to look for its configuration somewhere. <coughs> Let's see, I guess I should just go in and see what its uh, hook menu has. There we go. There we go. Oh, and admin people. There we go. Okay. That's the configuration. Oh. Oh yeah. There we go. People. Oh, and uh, I would try to slash manifest. Okay, yeah, just there we go. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Let's see what happened here. <laughs> yeah, I could do that. Man. Many people watching. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, we. Oh, that's why. <laughs> okay. What? A, what is our? Okay. Oh, undefined. undefined. Oh, many content. Okay, content. so. <laughs> we can define it. So that is um, one of the great chicken and egg problems. Is there's a bunch of constants that were defined in Drupal seven, and it does. So retrofit will install or will port the hook menu, but the basically in Drupal 7 hook menu was then converted to like five different APIs because they had all these wonderful constants that I didn't know existed. And they have to be defined in various files. Yeah, let's find out what that is. Okay. Can we run PHP stand to know about what's missing? Have to do after technically that. yes it would so that way you would scan it and say there's this it's called to an undefined constant so actually taking a Drupal seven putting the Drupal seven code in a Drupal ten then running PHP stand against it would find those things that are missing and like the gaps of retrofit it's actually a really good idea could you create a Drush generator to generate the info files yes I would, I wanted to, so a lot of this was working with it was me really having to be what delivers the best value. Because before I, I did hook menu and I did field types, but then I started going to entities for custom entity types. But then I realized somebody, well, no, somebody <laughs> said, what about themes? And then I was like, oh yeah, theme functions were a thing in Drupal 7. So it actually will render, it will, it uses a twig template that it provides and will r render your theme function, it will call it, and same with like your tipple fips. <laughs> um, so it will render those and I really had to just pick what to work on, and yeah, a Drush generator would be great because then it could just take any, find anything with that info and convert it for you. There we go. Catch build worked. Let's so you added that constant to. Cool he just contributed to yeah. retrofit. Do what? He added it for retrofit because oh, retrofit has to main, provide all those old constants. Got it. Okay. All right. Okay, and now we've got. Oh. Undef now that's a manifest function that should be that that should be uh, in there somewhere. Let's see. Fine. <coughs> okay. 
I'm not sure why it didn't um, load its own file. No, go to the dot module. They go to the command mm -hmm. So this is also the wonderful thing, is like Drupal 7, like ways of splitting things into random files that don't load. Mm -hmm. um, open the dot module file. Yeah, this is the dot module file. Oh, it is? Go to the top. Okay. They have, so that's not working. Uh, module load include not working. Well, we know it. You can just change it to the required yeah. ones, which yeah. also just as a note, don't you don't need to use require or module load include. Just use require once, and then you don't have to like bootstrap like to find the path. Um, so do require once, and then yeah, just manifest. Dot. Is it manifest? I that thing. Yeah. Yeah. So require uh, module load include should only be used if you're trying to load a file from another module, not from your own module. Okay. Okay. So now we've got normal errors that come from uh, data uh, format differences between Drupal 10 and and uh, Drupal 7. So it's a good time to go into how this works because if you want it to work, you're going to have to to uh, learn how to to uh, contribute to retrofit. Or I'm also not opposed to just posting issues and saying, I tried this, and then I can help you debug it. Because it is very early stages, and there's a lot of those little edges. All right. So the, the way retrofit works is uh, with, uh, with Composer. So we have, um, it, it's registering an autoload to, in, in Composer, so, so that you can, uh, so that the, when a retrofit uh, class file is uh, requested, it's there. We've got, um, and then we've got one co global constant. I, let's see, what, what was that one? Uh, trying to remember. That was like right underneath. Okay. So the real magic comes from that last file too, the bootstrap.php. Oh, could you open that one? Yeah. So this isn't a module. Um, it's, it's a package. And there's this thing I found out about Drupal way, way back ago where you can actually inject service providers like any other normal app. It's a little convoluted. So the way of, it's like a virus in a way. <laughs> <laughs> a good one. But I mean that it has an excellent delivery system. So this actually opens a service provider can command yeah, click on okay. to or go to the provider. And inside of it, just oh uh, whatever. There we go. Yeah. And so what it will do is if any of you've written a service provider for your models before, it's the same idea, but it's just dynamically doing everything. So here it adds its own namespace to Drupal. Um, oh, yeah. This is so that Drupal thinks it's a module. Um, right here. That's why it has its own namespace and composer, but then Drupal does all this wonderful stateful stuff. So this is actually telling it that, hey, this namespace exists so you can look for plugins. And then here it adds like a hook registry, hook menu routes. Um, so all the services get added to your Drupal site once it's added here. Um, so we have this global user setter. So in Drupal 7 you can say global user and that's how you knew the current account. That's a backwards compatibility layer for that. So when you call global user, it is actually giving you a wrapped version or an accessible version of the Drupal 7 user account. And you can interact with it like you did in Drupal 7. Um, same for languages. But this is the core of how Retrofit works. It's a service file. This is what then plugs into all the APIs and then calls back to the legacy ones. Yeah, so if you have ever uh, done uh, service decoration in, in Drupal 10, uh, where you, you have a Drupal core class that you need to <coughs> e extend or, or wrap, you, um, this is where it gets done. So it's a, it should be familiar to if you've done any Drupal 10 stuff. I'm going to show how the... Um, yeah. So when you have a... An, a Drupal 10 is, uh, is uh, returning an object, and uh, Drupal 7 expected an array with, and expected access to certain uh, keys on that array. And Drupal 10 
is making them private or, or protected properties. And it have, it, it's just, you need to do something like this, which is to uh, extend that to uh, the Drupal 10 class, implement array access. So we're doing this for form state, otherwise the Drupal 7 forms uh, have all kinds of problems. So we're, uh, and then we, we use our PHP magic methods uh, to, uh, well, oh, this, this is a, uh, an array access method. So if, the, if uh, uh, a property exists, it returns uh, <coughs> whether that property is set. Um, we had to list all the properties here because uh, um, these are the, the uh, protected properties in a form state array that you need special methods to get. So, but now your Drupal, our Drupal 7 code just accesses it as if it were a regular array. Yeah, so under the hood, whenever you work with something that's an array, it has these methods via the array access um, interface. So a lot of the retrofit code takes the classes that were made, or takes the classes that once used to be array shapes and appends them to this. So that way we can map them and you can work with it without rewriting your forms because no one wants to rewrite your forms if you don't have to. The same with fields. Uh, we, we've done, we have a good amount of, uh, of uh, work on, on fields. Let's see, where is that? Uh, oh, uh, Some two plugin. Slots. Yeah. Derivative. Yeah, let's go, let's go to derivative. Okay. So if you're not familiar with derivatives and derivers, in Drupal 10, it's a way of saying, I'm gonna use my one code base, my one class, but have Drupal think there's like 10 versions of it. And that's the core of how there's the support for here. So yeah, do we open, let's open the, um, let's do the field item one. Okay. <coughs> so what this will do is, let's go down and get derivatives. So what does it do? It invokes field info. So it goes back and it calls the old field info, or if it's blocks, block info. And then it goes through all the definitions and does like a little bit of mapping, like. Here's the label, the description, um, and here we can say that it's like retro field widget in the formatter, and then it also stuffs in the old field info. And now Drupal will think that there's template field, because that's now available, but really under the hood it's retrofit field, template field. And then now we can go to the plugin all right. for it. So then when Drupal goes to load the field or the you know, block, um, you have the decorated field item, so one thing I also try to do to, pre to prevent backwards compatibility issues with the backwards compatibility layer is it does a lot of decorations. So it's, it's not actually extending field item. So that way, if Drupal core changes it, we're only working with that interface to help make it be more stable and secure. Or, no, that doesn't have security, but to make it more stable for you and not have it randomly break. Um, so in it, it uses the inner, and then as it goes down, so like git, it does git property, because this is pretty straightforward. Um, let's go down some more to get properties. And this only works if the inner class lets you get to all the properties that you, you need. That's why we couldn't do that for form state. Where is the, where am I? The fields form settings. Or is that in a wheel? That's in a widget. Let's open the widget. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, and, and I don't think we got form settings completed. Okay. So let's go to, it's definitely not. Let's go, what? We did it somewhere. Okay. I might, I might have uh, not updated my, my... Okay, so like in here, we would say, what was this field name, and then go call the Drupal 7 hook, because it was a different hook for your field settings, and then I could say, we did it for some box. Go in the block file? Oh, okay, probably block. Let's see here. Yeah, here we go. So like block submit, Oh. Right here, so it would say like it gets the provider and then calls the hook, just like Drupal Seven would, and then calls the callable with the form state. So right now, you could take a Drupal Seven block and its existing form structure, its existing hooks, and the way it would save, and it actually calls it and then saves it, and it's in that config instance. So if you do have a site like let's say I was a big panels user and we had all kinds of blocks that we used, I'm not saying panels would work, but if you had a lot of those. Those are C tools plugins, not blocks. 
<laughs> Let's pretend they're blocks right now. <laughs> Let's say there are a bunch of blocks you wrote because that's how you compose your Drupal 7 site. Wouldn't it be great if you didn't have to rewrite every single line of PHP for those blocks and you could just plop them in and save that for the tail end? And that's the idea behind this. And like blocks are supported in that regard. Um, and then it does a few like mapping things here, like the caching system before there was like these three constants, like per role, per user, per page, and it will dynamically convert it to the cache context for you. Um, right now it is a bit specific and I would love to because blocks are the main ones that use it, um, but I'd like to make this a more general helper, like given this, it's these cache contexts. All right. Matt, hmm? I have a more just generic question on the process in general. Yeah. If I have a Drupal 7 working, the process would be install a Drupal then, add to it retrofit. Now what do I do between bringing each module, bringing database, how is that process would work? Two part. That's a good question. So the flow would be, you would run, you would do your migration, or actually I guess it is like a, normally to do a migration you have to copy all your code over first because they have field types and content types. So you could copy paste all your code over per se and then try to run a migration and see where it breaks. Um, that's how I would do it. And I feel like that's how we do it right now, but it's a much longer tail. You write all your code, then you start migrating, but now you can literally just plop it in and try to run a migration and see what happens. Um, but data is completely separate. And I feel like as a community, we've solved the data problem. It's really easy to migrate data and config, but not the code. And this is like that one, if there's three parts of a migration, content, configuration, code, you tackle two of them. And this is trying to handle that third case. Um, Yes, yeah, so like on a really big site, it could be a bit pairing, but also you can start getting feedback faster and work on it in parallel with your Google 7 site too. So as you work on this and you get things working, uh, you want to get the get it merged into the main uh, retrofit to repo, well, make a fork and then do it in your own branch. Um, you're going to need to make sure that the tests pass, otherwise Matt just ignores your merge request. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to show how what the three tests are that, that you have to run. Um, okay, first one is PHP. Uh, Fender, oh, oh, sorry, before you can run them, you have to run composer install. And that, uh, I've already done it here, but that, that uh, downloads all the dependencies for these uh, tests to run. And then you do php vendor bin php cs code sniffer. Make sure all the code is in the, uh oh, I indented incorrectly. It did some. Luckily, we can always use CBF with this because it's following PSR 12 and not, well, I guess Drupal, so you can use it as PHP CBF, but. Yeah. Okay, so um, maybe I'm all. Oh, no, I guess. What branch am I on? Oh, I'm. Okay, I need to get on. Uh, okay, but that's what I would need to fix. If I, if I decide, I, if I look at these errors again. Yeah, I, so um, I'm going to switch to a branch that doesn't have those errors. Git checkout. Because um, Matt just, oh, what happened? Git, oh, did I, I didn't put the, I don't have the upstream here. Um, Git remote, add upstream. And then what was the URL for that? Uh, so here's, uh, let me get his GitHub repository here. Retrofit, Drupal retrofit, there we go. Get uh, 
So Matt, do you take contributions on GitHub or do you take them on the issue queue on Drupal.org? It's, everything's on GitHub. Everything's managed on GitHub for this. Um, it's part of me like wishes I would have done it on Drupal.org, but it was before they rolled out GitLab CI and a lot of the general projects, or at least I wasn't as aware of them. So that way there could be like issue credits, um, but also it's a little bit easier to maintain and manage on GitHub than it is. Because we're not all on GitLab, but we're getting closer, so I'm like, if only. Oh, we still have, uh, still have these, even on the main branch. So you guys have any way of tracking to see how much okay. this might get used? Because if it's not a module, it gets you to install all Correct. I can track on packages how much it's downloaded, which ignores CIs, and that's kind of like a, I don't know. I don't know how comfortable people would be if I said I put telemetry in it and said, hey, is it okay if I randomly ping like Sentry or whatever tool? Like, I, what I want to look at actually is I know Drupal Core added open telemetry and I haven't like looked at it, but there is like part of the CNCF like this like new way of doing telemetry in an open standard and Drupal's gonna start using it. So maybe there's a way I could piggyback into that to do some kind of reporting, but I don't like the idea of like saying, hey, my code's gonna talk to someone else because I want to have trust in people, or people that trust it. Um, so it'd be like packages to see how many downloads there are, um, because packages should exclude anything from the CI and its download counts. And then it's just find it out from people who are giving it a try, like Darren, like if you are using it, and if they, even if you're like, this stinks, or it doesn't work, like just let me know, be like, why did it happen? Like, but I do think there is a value to it, but it is gonna be, every use case will be a bit unique in the beginning. Oh, you pick up the wrong yeah, okay, well, so we'll move on to the next test, which is PHP Stan. All right, now, okay, again, on the main branch, I'm not yeah. sure what that is. But if you look at these errors and you determine that some of them are, th that the errors that you're dealing with are not, um, should, should be ignored. You, you just run. Uh, you add generate baseline to to the uh, <coughs> PHP stand test, and it will generate you a new uh, uh, baseline file, and, and which will uh, ignore more of the errors for you. So you've got a bunch of new new uh, rules to ignore errors. Last one is. PHP unit. Which the unit there are at home. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. So this and it is one that this project, if you're curious about ways to do different ways of testing, it has its own unit test and it also does do a bootstrap of Drupal um, using some other weird little projects I've made, like a in memory SQLite kernel. Um, so if anything for that, like, just take it out and see like ways you can do extra testing. But it does do fully integrated tests with Drupal. So we've got to make sure the main branch works, and then on on your own branch, uh, uh, make sure should the tests pass, and then uh, the merge request will have the nice green check mark, so that Matt can and then Matt is pretty quick at, at reviewing. So uh, future uh, things. We've ta had some questions about uh, automatically upgrading uh, Drupal 7 code. I think that that could be done. We've got, we already have bots that go looking through modules for deprecated code. I think a similar um, process could, could work in, in, with, with Drupal 7 code. If we, in retrofit, marked the, some of these classes as deprecated. So something to, to work on. Actually, that would be fun. So, like Drupal Rector is the, the code that reformats everything, but I think it would be a poor idea to push all the Drupal 7 code fixes into, rec into Drupal Rector itself. But there, then maybe, like, I brought up extra packages that could be like Rector rules for retrofit that, okay, you're using retrofit, but you want to stop using it. Well, then it could have the rules that you put into Rector to automatically fix all your Drupal 7 code. So, again, it's like, all right. We're working, and now we're going to start fixing it, but man, I don't want to write, I don't want to touch all these lines of code. That could be a way to help automate it along the way. Um, and like going in the future, like I want this to, 
help teams and their senior developers and their tech leads. Um, I'm sure we've all been there where you have to do something and you go to a pull request and it's like, cool, this is 500 lines of code I have to review. And all these green lines and these giant blocks and the diff doesn't make sense because there's so much added, which is just what happens sometimes. But could you imagine, well, I mean, some of you have done Drupal 7 and Drupal 10, that cognitive load is intense. And the idea is to help reduce that cognitive load to make it a little bit easier so that we can move faster, iterate more, and deliver better. So that's, that's the goal for this project. Okay. And you can look in the, uh, the uh, issue queue, queue for, uh, on GitHub and see what things are, features are missing currently. You already saw we, we're still missing the uh, field settings mm -hmm. form. So. Yeah. And also, I'm trying to find a way that we can I can explain what APIs are covered. So there's not like a way I can dynamically generate that, and I don't know what that would even look like. Is it like D7 hooks to this? Because it does also support Drupal Add JS and Drupal Add CSS, which thank you for that. <laughs> so you know how Drupal 10, 8 took away the ability to do inline CS JavaScript? Retrofit kind of brings that back a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> for better or worse. Um, or using Drupal add JS to add arbitrary files as well. So it dynamically, it collects those and then at the end says, hey, there's this library that's dynamically generated and it will attach those files to you. So I'm pretty sure that like you're, yeah, if you do Drupal add JS, Drupal add CSS, it just works. Yeah. Um, themes, the one part for themes is automatically generating the, like, li the library for its CSS and JavaScript, but then you should be able to take a theme and go. Um, one area that it will be rough on is like pre-process functions. That never was like a good stable UI a, a API, and they renamed a whole bunch of things. But we tried to make some compatibility there. Yeah, we're we're still uh, we we have something to resolve on that. Yeah, so like it does provide a <laughs> node pre-process for itself, yeah. and then hooks in. Um, yeah, so like if you are curious, like how did you do this? Where does it do this? Just ask, and I can point from the code and show you. Yeah. Um, no, like if you try it and it's missing something, let me know. And this is what I'll be working on during the contribution uh, sprint this afternoon. So if anyone wants to um, have, see anything more specific, we can do that then. You're working on contributions for Drupal Retrofit, or yes. you're working on contributions for Drupal 7 modules that Retrofit. Retrofit. Which hopefully mod D7 modules shouldn't need changes. I think the C tools is the unique. Okay. Because it has so many classes. Right but you've got to add the .yaml file right. yes. to it. So it, it, is there a way to <coughs> contribute that back as a patch on the Drupal 7 module on Drupal.org? Yeah. And is there a way to tag those modules so that they can be tracked? It's a good question. I know as somebody who was on the end where I got like, a lot of issues when fixing, I can't remember what was added, like, something got both added, I would be nervous if we started getting patches on a bunch of Drupal 7 things saying, hey, there's this retrofit project, can we start committing this info.yaml file? Um, just so that way nobody looks at me and goes like, why, why are people doing this for your project? <laughs> um, so I would wait on that just in case, um, because I would also like to solve it doing it for you. Like I could make the core patch, it's just some things are locked down a bit more. But, I, what I would do for my projects, I would just keep the patch locally, which I always recommend don't use patches from Drupal, always have them local, so that way you don't have to download them. I would just patch that, have that patch locally for your contrib projects, and just have them applied that way. Um, the intent of that. this is not to, to not port your module, the intent of this is to bridge until you can yes. rework your module. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Right. And yeah, that's the idea, it's, it's to bridge, it's to, to change the story, so instead of it being upfront, it's the tail end of the process, so that way you can have more time and less under the under the pressure. And if you're not an expert, you can uh, use Retrofit as a guide to how to upgrade a module to Drupal 10, because we've got the expert who's already <coughs> done all. Retrofit is, can be used as example code. You know, mm -hmm. Any Drupal 7 function or class, you can just look in Retrofit and see how to replace it. Yeah. So there are some baseline docs that try to say like, oh, I have this API hook and where, where does it map to? So there is a like, oh, I wrote blocks. And like, I don't want to use retrofit, but maybe it can show me how to do blocks in Drupal 10. Obviously, there's a lot of content out there now, but it can be resourced for that too. <laughs> oh, and uh, if you want to contribute to documentation, still needs uh, to be improved. 
<laughs> and it, it's primarily geared, geared toward modules. I'm just sitting here running themes my too. Head on themes, and it's like that would be a whole complete different themes. Thing. I mean, themes. It works if you got your yep. node.tpl.php as an override, mm -hmm. and you have a sub theme and a sub theme. It works. It loads them. Um, it's just some of the pre-process. <laughs> And like I said, it's the fact that in Drupal 7, you had your theme.info and your like style sheets and they're built like an array in the INI file. And in Drupal 10, now modern Drupal, you need libraries. And that is the one disconnect. That's not there yet. Um, but yeah, so like themes for the most part, like I had um, Bartik. Yeah, so Bartik runs. So Drupal 7 Bartik runs in Drupal 10. Yeah, and if this... I'm trying uh, to uh, spin up our SD Lauder's uh, uh, demo site right now so, because we have the uh, Drupal 7 uh, theme running in this too. Right. So, yeah. Are we over? Are we over? Uh, yeah, we were, we we're supposed to be done at 1045. Okay. <laughs> Oh, thank you for coming. <laughs>